Good morning. I'm Laura DeLacy, the Executive Director of Milken Institute's Asia Center. On behalf of all my colleagues around the world uh, who are working from home, I would like to welcome you to the fifth episode of the webinar series, The World Post COVID-19. Every, every Friday at 8.30 a.m. Singapore time, the Asia Center at the Milken Institute is hosting short to the point conversations to address the transformations that will shape the world post COVID-19. Uh, now we have upgraded our experience with video. Uh, today's episode will focus on how business leaders are addressing the realities of a COVID-19 world and share with you what are the silver linings for their companies and, and employees. Uh, today's discussion will be moderated by Oreo Morrison, one of Asia Pacific's leading TV anchors and a veteran uh, moderator for the Milken Institute. She's joining us from Australia. Uh, we're aiming to bring the Milken Institute experience virtually to you every week. Uh, before I pass it on to Oreo, I would like to share with you what the Milken Institute is currently doing to address the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, we're approaching the situation, the situation in two ways. First, we're leveraging our network and working with public health leaders, policymakers, and, private, and the private sector to mitigate the economic and human impacts of COVID-19. As of today, our colleagues at Faster Cures they have tracked 182 potential treatments and 99 vaccines that are currently in development. Uh, in addition to tracking these vaccines and treatment, we're also tracking and coordinating philanthropic effort around the world. Here in Asia, our team has created a dashboard of, COVID of the COVID-19 crisis and how uh, seven different Asian governments have reacted in terms of public health decrees, stimulus package, financial aid, and we correlated to the number of positive cases. Um, and also want to share with you a new tracker that Milken Institute's uh, sister organization, our Prostate Cancer Foundation, they have created a tracker that talks about um, real-time data of, on uh, COVID-19, the effects of COVID-19 on cancer patients. And these are credible peer review information. I think it's interesting for those who, who have a history of cancer in their families. It's, it's worth checking it out. The second part of our effort is to really prepare business leaders to face the current situation and prepare for what comes next. So in addition to series like this one, we're also uh, creating articles called the Power of Ideas with different thought leaders expressing how they plan to rebuild for the future. Mike Milken also has a podcast on Spotify and Apple. Uh, and um, in each episode, Mike addresses how COVID-19 would change the way we work, socialize, fight disease for years to come. Uh, these are all different ways that Milken Institute is working with our stakeholders to understand the situation and prepare for the new world. So uh, with that in mind, I would like to pass it on to Oreo. Thank you so much, Oreo, for moderating our fifth episode. I'll leave you to it. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. It's really a pleasure to be with you all this morning, and I'm very excited uh, to be hosting this episode, which uh, is entitled For the Linings for Business. Um, I think the title says it all. And given the topic and the fact that we're going to be listening today to three hugely successful, and I should say entertaining as well, entrepreneurs, um, there's going to be no shortage of positives to take away from the panel today and lessons that we can all learn. Um, I just want to get straight into this uh, uh, topic today and introduce our panelists to you. Uh, Raj Ganguly is with us, co-founder and partner at B Capital. Magnus Grimeland, the founder and CEO of Atlas, and Chatri Sijotong, a founder and chairman of One Championship. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you all so much for joining us here at uh, this Milken, Milken webinar. Um, Raj, let me kick things off with you and ask you a very direct question. It's a very difficult environment. Um, that we're currently in, in a very tragic environment uh, for many out there globally. Um, let's talk about the impact on business. Now, your business is essentially a global tech VC fund. What sort of impact are you seeing on business uh, from the current situation with COVID-19? You know, and, and thanks, Oriel, for, for having me on. Um, I, it's a great question to start with. I mean, the, the reality is this is unprecedented. We've never seen um, the the entire world essentially come to a stop from from a business sense, and um, it's it's having an impact across our portfolio. We've got 36 investments globally across um, uh, three continents, and um, for some of our businesses, um, this has meant that they've essentially come to a stop. Um, for some of our businesses, there's been um, a, a significant slowdown. And then, you know, we're, we're a significant investor in digital health and some virtualization tools. And frankly, those businesses are, are doing better than, than ever before. So it, it's really been sector by sector, the, the impact of this. Um, and, and we're still so early in it that I think most entrepreneurs are still thinking about 
the recession and very few are thinking about the rebound and even fewer are even thinking about reimagining um, how their businesses will have to work after all this. So it's, it's early days. It is, it is very early days. And, and are we in a recession? What do you believe the IMF? Yes, we are indeed. Others say that we're not there yet. Um, Magnus, let me bring you into the conversation as well, because obviously you're dealing with startups and founders on, on a daily basis, in it, including the fact you're running your own business as well. So do you agree with much of what Raj has said or are you feeling that uh, uh, your founders are really looking to what's next and, and actually looking for the recovery uh, at this point in time? Well, so I, I think what Raj says is, is absolutely correct. We have, I think, now about 170 portfolio companies across six continents and they really fall in those buckets, Raj, I think very nicely put out there, which is some business almost stopped for, others um, you know, are struggling to create growth that otherwise would be easier. And then you have the ones that are really you know, growing 10x due to the current situation because they're solving issues related to uh, the current crisis. I think one of the things that we've seen that is incredibly important as we work on building companies from scratch with uh, exceptional people who are very early on in their journey is that the mindset that founders have during this crisis is incredibly important. I, 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 my first job was, was, was in the Navy SEALs and we did some medic training there. And one of the things that we learned to always say when you see uh, someone who's, who's severely injured is, I've seen worse. And you didn't say that because you hadn't necessarily seen worse, but it changed the mindset of the patient. And I think this is incredibly important for entrepreneurs these days is you know, you need to think that if what I was doing was important before, um, because I was creating value for my customers, for my team and my investors, what our entrepreneurs are doing now is almost, they almost have an obligation to succeed because, you know, society is relying on our entrepreneurs and our portfolio companies to create new employment opportunities, to create that GDP growth that we need coming out of, uh, out of this recession and uh, on the path to recovery. And this is a lot for early stage startups related back to the mindsets of the founders and, and building a business in the best of times is incredibly hard. And now it's harder. And if you let a little bit of doubt seek into your mind that you will succeed, that is almost becomes a foregone uh, conclusion uh, that, that you will fail. So we spend a lot of time kind of ensuring that our founders keep up that positive mindset that you know, either this is a pause in your business, looking at how you can pivot and create opportunities, or for the ones that are struggling with this immense growth, uh, to, you know, ensure that, uh, you know, they have that positive mindset that out of this will, will, will uh, you know, be a decade's worth of growth. And they are so important. Obviously, the front line of, uh, you know, our hospitals, doctors, and, and nurses are, are even more important, but the entrepreneur also has an obligation uh, in this crisis to succeed. And if you bring that mindset in there and create a bit of that warrior mentality, um, I think it really, really helps uh, our teams uh, inject a bit of uh, energy into the business, which is sorely needed right now. No, I absolutely love that attitude. It's very, very positive one. Um, Maybe I can just add on to just to add on, so I, I think Magnus, it, you know, made the point very articulately. And, and I think what you know, he and Antler have done globally and at scale, um, you know, gives them real perspective on, on you know, what's happening in the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, you know, over the past decade, every entrepreneur I've met as an investor has told me that their business is mission critical to their customers. Well, the most interesting thing is over the course of the past few months and the coming year, we're really going to know whose businesses are mission critical and which ones aren't. And of course, in the short term, it's been a number of healthcare businesses and grocers, and but every business has an opportunity to really think about how do they make their business mission critical to their customers, um, and and that really to me is is the first silver lining of of what we're in, which is we're all going to find out which businesses are are really uh, important to their customers and which ones, frankly, were just nice to have. Mm. Um, Chatri, let me bring you into the conversation here because you've always had a hugely positive attitude, um, you know, for the longest time, you know, since I've known you, you've always thought outside the square when it comes to business and, and, and running business. I mean, uh, your business is being hit hard simply because it is a physical business. Um, 
you know, you are obviously one of the largest MMA pr promoters out there. How are you handling the situation? Uh, well, yeah, definitely. I mean, with, with uh, I think it's around 92 countries now that have their borders closed and, and obviously lockdowns across the region uh, makes it very difficult, uh, especially for a live sports business. So whether it's NBA, NFL, you know, Major League Baseball, you know, EPL, all the major global sports properties like us have literally come to a screeching halt. Um, but on the flip side, it has given us a, a time to think about our business and think about what other types of content can we create during this time? Um, and, you know, even though we are a sports media property, there's so much shoulder content that fans love and that fans want to see, um, in addition, obviously, to our archives. So there's still many, many creative options for us to continue what I always say RFE internally, which is reach, frequency, and engagement. Uh, we're always pushing our reach, frequency, engagement numbers every week, every month. And surprisingly, our numbers have gone up. Uh, in this time, uh, as a media property, you know we're broadcast in 150 countries. We're on, and most of uh, uh, our media partners have kept this on air, uh, even though they're reruns or new new forms of content. They're not the live events, um, and so that's what I mean about uh, extraordinary times creating extraordinary companies. You have to, and I say to my team, there's two factors that are very very important. One is creativity because we're going to be faced with problems we've never seen before. And you have to have a creative out of the box mindset to solve things because the business as usual mindset won't solve them. Uh, and then secondly, you have to have resilience. Um, now more than ever, uh, uh, you know, company leadership, company teams, um, you know, getting up every day, being self-motivated, getting a thousand no's, a thousand rejections. Um, you know, it, it, it's just going to be part of the world today. Um, and, uh, I love that, 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 that mindset of, are we mission critical? And I think um, for sure, live sports is mission critical uh, to the world in terms of giving inspiration, giving hope, giving entertainment, giving families magical memories to celebrate or countries magical memories to celebrate around their heroes. And so, you know, for us, uh, it's, it's uh, hard, definitely hard, but we don't just do live events. We have a whole content stack. And and one of them, for example, that we're launching later this year is The Apprentice. So we're doing a, The Apprentice, a, a global version uh, with one championship IP uh, in conjunction with MGM, where we co-own uh, this new edition of The Apprentice, where we inject all of our world champions in there, as well as uh, global CEOs, and create a new version of The Apprentice, which uh, I'm really excited for. And, let, and let's hope the borders are open to enable that to, that to happen uh, at Chhatri. Do you think that you know, the changes that you're making to your business strategy at this point on long-term changes, are there changes that will remain once borders are open and, and people are vaccinated and things go back to whatever normal is? I mean, whether or not that's a, new, a completely new normal or whether that's more similar to where we were just a few months ago. I think uh, there's a lot of people who are living being over dramatic about, oh, this is, a, this, is gonna, this is going to create a new world order uh, and a new way of living. And, you know, I think human beings are far more resilient. I think travel will bounce back. I think staying in hotels will bounce back. I think, uh, you know, maybe 90% of the way we used to live will bounce back. Um, you know, while I don't want to belittle COVID-19, if you really, really look at the numbers, you know, uh, there are far many more diseases or, or, or of equal diseases that have the same mortality rate that people are dying every, every day, but the media is not covering it. Um, this is almost kind of a, um, for me, it's a political conundrum for governments. And that's why it's, it's been so heavily focused on in, in, the, in the media. You know, on one hand, like, let's take a look at Donald Trump, right? If, if, even if there's a 1% mortality rate, if 100 million Americans get infected, it's a, it's a million people who die. And a million people who died in an election year is very, very detrimental. On the flip side, though, with, 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 the, with the current lockdown, I think one in five Americans are now unemployed. If that goes to one in three, he's also going to not get uh, reelected. So for, for, for Donald Trump and many incumbent governments, it's a political decision of these lockdowns are not necessarily because, oh my goodness, this virus is so deadly. This is Ebola or something where mortality rates are super high. It's more of a, you know, I want to get reelected and uh, I need to make the decisions that's best for my reelection. You know, that's kind of how I, I, I see it. Of course, of course, a president should be looking after the, the welfare of the entire country as well. So I'm not, I'm not belittling that. But obviously, if, if there's a national health care crisis and, and hospitals are 
collapsing and people are dying, um, no incumbent government can can get reelected. It's quite difficult to look at it in that sort of you know uh, very harsh light, uh, isn't it, Chantry? When you're talking about uh, uh, people's survival and, and yeah. the tragedy that we're seeing, you know. But, but 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 I really believe that's what's going on uh, in, in in many governments. I, I really believe it. I really believe that because because why why is it that this is the disease that we chose to to to, to rally? And it's almost like peer pressure. If, if a few governments start doing lockdowns, start closing borders, start doing massive testing, then it, it, it's it's if you don't as a government, then you look bad and and vice versa. I, can, I even saw in the in, in in Asia, you know, the whole trickle down. Right at first. Some governments were taking it very lightly and just said, let's have the whole herd vaccination mentality. And then you could quickly see that they, they, they pivoted. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's, um, I don't know, like I'm, I'm not as, uh, and maybe it's because I'm always an optimist. I'm not as like, wow, this is going to change the world. I, I think it's going to be a, a very, very difficult era, maybe 18, 24 months of, you know, stops and starts and, and state periods of, mm -hmm. in terms with periods of stabilization. But you know, I think there's uh, current crop, uh, current drug cocktails that are very promising uh, that could end up, you know, end up uh, curing uh, a patient in five to seven days, and then of course within 18 months there should be a vaccine. So it's a well, very, well, very Let's hope that uh, Chantry, that you're that you're right on that one, and that um, uh, you know, hopefully by all accounts it may even be sooner than than 18 months, um, but let's hope that's the case. Um, Magnus, let, let me bring the conversation back to you for a moment, um, you know, because Chatri made some interesting points. I mean, are you finding that your founders um, are looking at, at the world now differently, or do you think that, um, um, as Chatri mentioned, things are gonna go back to normal, like as they almost as they were uh, uh, before? Well, I, I think it depends uh, what area of operations people are in. Um, so obviously, uh, there are some companies now growing incredibly fast, and they need to think about what happens if part of their customer base will uh, will change if people's behaviors because people's behaviors now are different than they will be when things normalize. Right? So they need to build resilience into the future. And then there are others where their business is really affected, which are looking at pivoting, finding new ways to do things, improving their product, finding you know runway capital during this period of time that they come out of the crisis stronger, even if their revenues have dropped during the current situation. So it, it really depends um, by company, but I think it's incredibly important that all of them think um, a bit long-term. I mean, the game that you know we are in, the business we are in is long-term. We, we have a 10-year perspective of everything we're doing. So for the companies who are in survival mode, it's about coming through the crisis stronger. Um, and I like what Chatri said, you know, extraordinary times build extraordinary companies. You're going to learn so much through this crisis that will just make you a much meaner and leaner and better company than the ones who have only seen great times. And then there's the ones that have now have a spurt of growth, like in the telehealth, the biotech industry, in ed tech. We have a bunch of companies working on remote teams, you know, Zoom times uh, solutions where the customers are just going through the roof when they need to look at how is that going to be sustainable in the future? Um, so I think that's with the current portfolio. Then I think what is going to come, happen long term, I, I, I tend to agree with Chatri that most will return back to normal. But then I think there are some specific areas where we're working with new entrepreneurs to look at new opportunities. I, I think, for example, education is incredibly exciting, right? I mean, I, I also have a son here who, you know, now has been doing homeschooling for a while. And, you know, I think education will, will do you know, decades worth of development uh, in, in a few weeks, because I think most people who are parents on this call have kind of realized how, you know, yeah, it kind of works, but the tech solutions are not all that great, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's definitely not as good, and it's definitely not better than um, you know, what you currently have uh, in, in school. And that, you know, it's just such a lost opportunity because, you know, with technology, you could actually provide kind of Harvard level education to people that today don't have access to education at all. So it's just a very exciting area. I think the health space obviously incredibly exciting. Manufacturing, uh, the way we work, um, the way we communicate, supply chains. Like look, look just at Singapore where we are right now, who are thinking very, you know, very thoughtfully around how they will secure the supply chain over the next decade with regards to 
food stock with regard to critical medical equipment, all these types of things that people really, a lot of governments haven't thought about this for, uh, you know, since, since the Second World War. And, uh, uh, you know, and within that whole area lies a lot of opportunity that we are working with new entrepreneurs to help explore. I mean, the last, we built 60 companies so far this year around these types of problems uh, across six continents. And we're going to continue to do that, I think, over the next, next, next few months to kind of see how, how can we contribute and how can we work with exceptional people to, to take those opportunities and also help solve some of those problems. Wow, 60 companies in what, four months? That, that's incredible, Magnus. Congratulations are in order, I think, for that. 12, 12 in Sydney, 12 in Sydney. <laughs> wow, even better. Um, go Australia. Um, Raj, let, let me bring you in um, in here to this conversation because you've got a, a, a number of portfolio companies in your portfolio as well. Um, you were a later stage investor um, than Magnus is, so your companies would tend to be um, bigger, uh, slightly more established, uh, companies, please correct me if I'm wrong. So your your view and, and the, the entrepreneurs, the founders' view on what is going on now may be slightly different. Is it as easy to pivot at, at the stage that your companies are at? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it really depends on what kind of pivot we're, we're talking about. You know, we, we have businesses which um, our businesses are generally later stage. They're, they're, they're larger businesses um, for for some of our businesses, um, this has really been an opportunity that um, that they've been waiting for. They're looking at making acquisitions of talent and IP and, and even purchasing revenue um, by acquiring other companies at prices, frankly, that three months ago that you know we we couldn't have believed. Um, there's a timing question. Um, do you do you take advantage of of some of those acquisition opportunities now, or do you wait six months because the prices might go even lower? Um, we also see that you know a, a lot of our entrepreneurs are thinking about just uh, how do they really accelerate their their uh, path to profitability. Every business we invest in has revenues, but um, they're not all yet profitable. Um, and I think for every entrepreneur that had a five year plan or a ten year plan to become profitable, those have become five month plans and ten month plans um, to become profitable. So this has led to a, a significant acceleration in thinking about things like profitability. I do think though that pivoting into new markets or new products that you don't understand that this is not necessarily a great time, that this is a great time for, for you to do well, um, things that, that you understand. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, we took a look at the last recession from 2008 to 2010, and we found out that the best companies were well prepared, that they did acquisitions, they experimented, they made rational cuts, they did a lot of things right, and there was some predictability about which ones were going to succeed. But then there was this intangible factor, and um, going back to Chatri's comment, um, I, I'd say uh, a slight modification. What our research showed is that it's not extraordinary times create extraordinary companies, it's extraordinary times create extraordinary leaders who then create extraordinary companies. And that's the intangible piece. I think this is one we're gonna see true leadership and the companies where leaders are not just going on the defensive, but they're going on the offensive and they're going on it quickly. And they're thinking about the, the recession, they're thinking about the rebound, but frankly, they're thinking about how they're gonna come out of this and be a stronger business. And, and this is an opportunity for every business to become mission critical to their customers. Um, and that's that's what's going to be exciting over, over the coming years. So, so I'd like to put a question then out there to, to all three of you, um, because there is a downside to this whole situation. I mean, aside from the obvious downside, for entrepreneurs, for startup founders, um, a lot of them don't have the cash to push in a, a, a long-term downturn in business or sales or revenue. And if you look at what well, Goldman Sachs have done a survey recently, which says around about 50% of the business owners that were survey said they didn't think that they could continue business operations in a downturn for longer than three months. Um, there's a fairly high chance this situation will go on for a lot longer than that. In fact, it almost already has. Um, how would you answer that question? How, how do you handle things then as a startup if you don't have that cushion of cash? Uh, I'm going to put that out there. Who would like to take that one first? Yeah, I, 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 I'm happy to comment. You know, I, I, I think that ultimately 
um, we are going to see that there's great businesses that just can't get get funded. But I hope that's not the case. I hope that from the last recession, investors like myself and Magnus have have understood that uh, actually the mean returns from investing in in startups in growth tech, the highest they've ever been in the last. 15 to 20 years was during the last great financial recession and that great businesses should get funded regardless of their timing. But it is incumbent on entrepreneurs to prove that they're great businesses and it's going to be tougher than ever to do that today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I completely agree with Raj. Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's the, 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 the capital is out there, right? Obviously, if you're running a big business where you're running huge deficits, it's different. But most of the companies we're talking about, um, you know, they, they, they are fundraising quite frequently and there is capital available out there. I mean, $100 billion, excluding the Vision Fund, $100 billion was raised by VC in the last two years. It's more than ever. Um, we have in our portfolio, I think we made 10, we made 10, we have 10 companies over the last two weeks only that raise in uh, capital from new investors. So not from their existing investors, but new investors. The capital is there, uh, but fundraising and cutting costs and ensuring a longer runway, all these things are hard in the best of times. So it brings me back to the point I made earlier. It's just so important to not let that doubt go in there. It, it's, it's harder in the best of times. Now it's going to be at times five or 10 times harder. That just means that you need to be 10 times smarter or speak to 10, 10, 10 times as many people. Um, but if that doubt sticks in, that's when you start not being able to accomplish these targets and these goals. You need to just be at it and be at it even harder. But the capital is there and the investors out there are smart. There are people like Raj, Chatri, people on this call, they know that now is also a great, great opportunity to get in there and support exceptional companies. And uh, I think the people who do that and have that mindset will, will come through this uh, and at some point in time, the next one or two years, be strengthened. And the ones who don't have that mindset, um, you know, will, will not succeed. Yeah, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you on that, Magnus. Um, Chad, you come on in here and, and give, me, give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, some startups uh, are fortunate to have a very strong shareholder base, a very strong board that supports them, that has ex experience gone, going through downturns and whatnot. Um, I would say um, I agree. If, if you have a great business model, if you're a platform business, if you're asset light, if you're IP heavy, uh, like sports media properties are, um, then it, it isn't such a challenge. I mean, we've, I've been very grateful in this time that, you you know, in bad times, you get to see the true colors of uh, who you're working with. And, you know, I've been very, very um, surprised and grateful um, that our board has given us full support and that, you know, um, it, it's incredible, whether it is advice, whether it is, you know, strategic, uh, um, you know, powwows or, or help or, or capital. Uh, we've been very lucky to have uh, some really resilient investors who've been through many things. And so, who really still believe in 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 uh, in us, and so you know, from one challenge perspective, we're we're, we're kind of lucky. We we do have a, a big balance sheet. We do have a, a reasonable runway um, over the next few years. We we could uh, you know sustain ourselves, um, even the worst case scenario for, for the next few years. So in that sense, we're we're, we're kind of lucky in that. But at the same time, when I started one championship, you know, uh, and trying to build Asia's first uh, uh, global sports property. I had studied sports media businesses very, very closely and effectively they are very, very asset light, IP heavy businesses, highly scalable, very much like actually pure tech software businesses um, where the incremental, um, the marginal cost of creating content is very, very low. And yet the, 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 the marginal um, uh, revenues and the impact you have on the business is, is, is significant. I'll just give you an example, you know, NBA's, um, $52 billion property in terms of its market value, if you put all the pieces together, and it's operated by 750 people. There are not many $50 billion businesses that are operated by 750 people. So we're all sitting in that camp. We're very, very fortunate. You know, we're in 150 countries, um, but yet we're very, very asset light, IP heavy, and we're a true platform business in the sense that entire ecosystem, you know, 
it, it derives value from us, whether it's broadcasters, brands, governments, agencies, fans, athletes, and whatnot. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more inspired and more excited than I've ever been uh, because this is a time, and I tell this to my team, this is a time where we find out how great we are. And that's, that's the end of it. If you can't embrace challenge, if you can't embrace um, very difficult times as, as a team, as a company, as a leader, um, then you're not worth your salt. Because, you know, in good times, everyone does well. But the real mark of a test, you know, is a ship is not made for the calm waters of the harbor. A ship is made for the rough seas in search of new horizons. And great captains are not made in, in the harbor. They're made in the rough seas. And that's what I tell my team. I say, guys, this is the greatest opportunity of our lives. It might be the worst uh, catastrophe in 100 years, but this is the greatest opportunity of our lives, not only to, to, to learn and inherit incredible IP of how to operate, how to steer the ship in, in the most incredible storm, but also, you know, again, as I, I go back to creativity and resilience. Uh, those are the two things that I tell my team that we need the most right now. And I, I think uh, great companies, great leadership, great teams, uh, will thrive in this environment. And I think that, that it's just a perfect place to um, to end this conversation on that uh, a bit of positivity. You are always one of the most positive people I know, Shatri, that's, that, that's for sure. And I really do appreciate your time. And Raj and Magnus, thank you so much for joining us here on this webinar today. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear all of your views and to learn from your experiences you know, about what to do in this world. And I think, Laurie, you'll, you'll agree, because I know that you've been listening uh, to us as well, that, um, you know, isn't it wonderful to hear such positive anecdotes and, and such a lot of passion um, around what can be done in, in this environment? Yeah, thank you so much. I thought that was really inspiring. And on behalf of all the listeners, I'd like to give you a round of applause. Thank yeah. you so much for doing this. It was insightful. It was optimistic and, and hopeful. So I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, before we go, I would like just to plug our, our next week's uh, webinar. We're going to have, um, it's going to focus on the role of media. I know we talked a little bit about that today, the role of media in terms of shaping and addressing the COVID crisis. We're going to have Gary Blue, who's the CEO of the South Chinese Morning Post, Maria Ressa uh, from Rappler will be joining us. Uh, so it's going to be a, a really interesting discussion. I hope you guys can join us next week. Thank you again, everyone. Wishing you a good day. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.